Hey everybody, good to see you back once again, <laughs> walking into things. The day has finally arrived. That's right, we're gonna put those monster 20 inch wide pads onto the chains that we just finished refurbishing. So I've got the right side chain laid out right here, but we're going to start with this left side for reasons that I will cover later in the episode. I've got to double over on itself and I'm gonna explain what the work plan is for that. I have all of the new hardware, well, some of the new hardware, I should say, laid out on the bench. There's all the new bolts, the new lock washers, and the new nuts are still in the bag because, uh, well, we'll talk about the ones I'm actually going to use in a bit. But there are a couple of anomalies with the new CAT hardware that I want to discuss with y'all. We're going to take, um, yeah, see, that's the new nuts right there. We'll take a sample with us. All right. Numbers in the parts manual. So we have a 2B5484 track shoe bolt, 2B5483 nut, and a 3B4507 lock washer. Those carry over to new numbers. So the bolt turned into an 8S4723. When I bought them recently, they were $1.11 each. The nut turns into a 9S8905, 41 cents each, and the 3B4507 lock washer, Still the same number, 22 cents a piece. So the first material difference showed up in the new bolts. We'll go into the bolt selection guide and it lists all the part numbers and it gives you a breakdown of how the bolt should be constructed. So we've got body length, which is everything from the base of the head all the way down to the end of the bolt. And then grip length is any unthreaded portion between the base of the head and where the threads begin. So we look for our 2B5484 part number right here. It should be a one and nine sixteenths body length with an 11 sixteenths grip length. So you can see body length is appropriate, but grip length is not. That's maybe an eighth of an inch effective grip length down there. And um, well, to contrast, here is a torched off original track bolt that I took out of one of the links. And what I do is I'll torch the nut off and then let the lock washer be like the sacrificial barrier so that I don't actually go down and bite the length. So you can see the grip length on the original bolts gets you through the hole in the track pad and it gets you 90% of the way through the hole in the link. And then the lock washer, well, where the threads start just off the end of my finger, the lock washer basically occupies the area where the threads begin. So then your nut has good threads all the way down. This is a much better, stronger bolt because that unthreaded grip length right there is going to help it to stay tight in the link and in the pad for much longer than this one would because this one you're going to be contacting most of those bolt holes just with these sharp thread tips they will wear faster that being said i will still use these new cat ones and the other difference i found was the original bolts had a 5 8 hex head the new ones are an 11 16 much more common grade 8 markings on the head and of course the classic cat taller head on the bolt as well. That's good for undercarriage applications. You can wear away some more material before that gives up and starts to fail. So the other major difference is in the design of the new nut. I could tell from the instant I looked at these that this was not gonna fly. So these are the new 9S 8905s. Going back to the original 2B5483 number, we see it listed right here. It specs out a 7 16 nut high. This is not a high nut, that is a standard one. And you can really tell the difference when we compare it to the set of high nuts that I have right here. That's maybe two thirds to half of the nut that the appropriate high version is. So I decided we're not gonna use those new track nuts. That's kind of disappointing because I could have bought a standard nut from anywhere, um, probably for cheaper. So luckily I've got this set of new old stock high nuts and they had been stored away and were a bit rusty, not too horrible. So 240 sequences later of de-rusting the hex <laughs> sides, both ends, uh, running a round wire brush through the threads on the inside, then chasing with a tap to make sure everything was appropriate. Solvent bath to clean any residual rust powder off and then set on a rag to air dry. We've got a complete set of right, correct, and proper high nuts for the new bolts and the new lock washers. And I thought it was very much worth going through all those boring details because when you're working with undercarriage, things like that matter. They do add up. And as we proceed, you'll see firsthand once I start fitting that hardware, what I'm talking about. And this also is not an instance of cat like cheaping out or lowering quality. It's the fact that those old part numbers just became obsolete because they haven't fit anything outside of a D2 track chain ever. And 
you know, D2s have been out of production obviously for decades now. And there just comes a time where they say, these are obsolete. We're gonna discontinue making any more new ones, but here is your next closest uh, part number stand-in equivalent that can be used if someone still needs to do some track work on a Cat D2. That's what you just saw right here. There are better options available. You can take those dimensions I gave you and go to outside bolt suppliers to get correct grade bolts with correct grip links and correct grade um, tall nuts to suit the applications. So that pretty much covers all that detail stuff for now. Let's start putting some track pads on. This is so much easier with two hands. <laughs> I think we can scoop four of these. Three, four, there we go. Wouldn't it be embarrassing after using that track gauge, putting these links together, if I couldn't get those bolts to start? <laughs> The only spec the manual gives you for these bolts is 70 to 80 foot pounds. I settle in at 75, should be good. All right, we're as far as we need to go for now for track pads for the left side, and I also did the same amount for the right side. And coming back one last time to those taller track nuts, this is why I prefer to stay with them. You can see they use every bit of the thread of the bolt. You don't have anything sticking out above the nut. If I would've went with those standard height ones, we'd have had like, you know, half of that would have been exposed thread that rusts and then it becomes really tough to get the nut back off of it if you ever need to come back and do that one day. Also, these links will trap rocks and everything else. The sprocket will pound the rock into those bolt threads, mash them over. Again, it makes it really, really difficult to take things back apart when that happens. So sizing the nut to the length of the bolt, making sure they flush out evenly, that's a very, very good thing, especially when you're working with tracks. Now, the plan here, the reason why We've only got oh, about half of the track pads on each chain. It's because these 20s get so heavy so fast. So what I'm going to do is, well, the ones that are installed, they're just the ones that need to be on the bottom. We'll loop these other tracks off, slide these under, set the machine down on them, and then I'll take the bare chain, loop it around, master pen it, tension it somewhat, and then we will install the rest of the track pads all the way around. That's the easiest way that I can think of to do it by myself. You can see what the book calls for. You have a guy that just, well, walks the track around as the drive sprocket pulls it and feeds it up to the front idler. Well, two reasons I can't do that. One, I don't have an assistant. Two, I don't own a white lab coat. Removing this outer rock guard will give me the room I need to slide the new track under the rollers. And of course the front dirt guard has to come off in order to access the tensioning nut to slack the track. Track slacked.
Master pin out. I want to take just a quick minute to point out a few visual cues. When assessing undercarriage, we know the pin and bushing wear is at 100% on this track. It's got a lot of stretch, all right? Look at the gaps here and here between those links. Compare that to the chain that we just turned the pins and bushings on. We bunched all that slack. No gaps at all, just a consistent line right there on that joint. Another thing to look at, all the shiny spots and where they are on the sprocket teeth. They're all out way towards the tips. They're not in the pockets at all. And compare that too with the shiny spots on the bushings. It's all heavy sprocket tip contact, nothing on the pocket. That's because this chain has all that stretch. It's running out of pitch with the pockets on the sprocket. I know it rhymes, but that's what we've got going on. So as these sprocket teeth come around, instead of just the pocket landing on a bushing, you're having the tip of that tooth grab onto it and try to pull it into the pocket. That's why when tracks get to a certain amount of wear, a certain amount of stretch, it just accelerates the wear on everything. Okay, now we begin the battle of the master link. So these are the later style links that need the spacers to plug that counterboard because that master bushing is of the shorter style. So, And these are really fun to keep in place. So we've got them loaded in each side. And now, pardon my hand being in the way, but I have to hold that one in. Yep, it fell out. All right. All right, there we got them both in place. There, started that master bushing just enough that it's gonna hold them in for now. I'm gonna use temporarily my dummy pin that I made for um, aligning these, uh, these open-ended masters. First, I need to pull a little bit more slack. There, I just got it started into the bushing. This should have been a step number one. Just put a little bit of slick stuff on there. There we are, I can see it in the link bore on the other side. That's gonna hold us together until we can press that new master pin in. And just like that, we're set up for the next phase of the process, and that is pushing the new master pin in. And I say new master pin because, yes, I purchased new ones, and this is the current design right here. This is the current part number. So if you go get a master pin for a Cat D2 from Caterpillar, it is going to be an 8L5560. That is all they offer now. They did away with this earlier style 
split and hollow pin that uses the taper plugs to expand these out into those pin bores and hold it tight. For ease of removal and installation, honestly, I do like these old hollow ones better, but this is a much stronger design. And they're identified by just a dimple on each end. That's how you determine which one out of all those pins is the master pin. And you can see there's a little bit of a step off the end of my thumbnail. That is because it is normal diameter on each end for about an inch. And then this whole center section is about 10 thousandths undersized. So that just helps you to get those driven in and driven back out a little bit easier. Um, the setup here. So I mentioned driving them in and out. They are kind of meant to be hammered. Um, whenever I have the option to do a steady controlled push with hydraulics, I will choose that over hammering any day. So we have the small 17 and a half ton ram with some various puller setups and what is going to happen is as the master pin is pushed in, it is just going to drift that dummy pin that is currently holding everything together right out the backside. Pretty simple. Let's do it. And I expect this to probably loosen up and drop a little bit once that first larger diameter gets through that pin bore. That's kind of the way they're meant to work. Just have to watch travel on the ram, make sure I don't bottom the cylinders out. Okay, there we go. Yep, I was gonna say we just got much easier. So, I believe we might have to tap it because there's probably a little bit of tension on it, but we should be able just to tap it. Yep. All right, there, you can hear it got solid again. That's because our press fits are about to re-engage with the bores. So we'll retool the setup, push it the rest of the way home. We're actually pushing about six tons right now. So that's good. I want that to be tight. dummy pin. And I don't like the way we're drifting sideways. Time to save it before we lose something. I think that finally did it. I got a bit of a story to tell y'all now. All right, so it is the next day. We've been battling this for a while. Pardon the furnace running there. Uh, I didn't expect to have the success that I did, so it was time to turn the camera on and go. Um, I had to retool this quite a bit because what I found, well, you can see I took my gauge plate and I bolted it to that master link. And I'll show you on the gauge still, 17 and a half ton range on the inside. We were pushing 10 tons by the end to get that master pin fully seated, which is good. I want it to be tight. The reason it bound on me and that cylinder kicked sideways last night was because, okay, we're pushing into this open link right here. And although the master bushing end is in between those, it's still a bit loose. And what was happening was since I am backstopped against the outside of the one and pushing the master pin into the other one, I had a little bit of flex happening where they were tightening in on that master bushing. And when you're dealing with press fit bores that are that close you know, to tolerance, when you get any kind of a deflection like that, it binds the whole thing. So what I ended up doing was taking the studs out of my gauge tool that I used to set the spacing. And I used that as a stand-in track pad to bolt there and stabilize those links. Normally you're not pushing master pins and things like this on just bare chain. Usually you've always got track links on there, or track pads on there, I should say. The track pads would have interfered with my whole setup here, so we have to do it without them on. So that was actually, that's actually a very versatile tool. That was the best thing I could have had. So yeah, these solid master pins have really been um, a learning curve. You just don't have to deal with pressure like that with these old style split ones. They just slide right in, but 
that solid pin is way, way stronger than this due to its hollow design and the slits that are already in it. So for those really wide tracks, these solid masters, I think, are the way to go, even though it has been <laughs> quite a lot of work getting that pressed home. And as you can see, with the chain properly tensioned once more, I've begun installing the remaining track pads. You guys ready for this? We all know what the before looks like. And around to the other side is the after. <laughs> Quite the difference there. <whistles> yeah, I mean that sprocket is like a foot inside of the track. The rest of the undercarriage tucked way in as well. And that's a lot of real estate. I'm already a little bit nervous though because when you put tracks on there that wide, if I ever had to work on this, it's an excellent place to put your tools, but that's where it ends, all right? Uh, I'm probably gonna have to break track anytime I ever have to get into the side of the engine. That's, you can't even really fit your hand in there sideways, but um, here, let's open the door again. Get a little better look. We're a bit dark outside, but I had to. Yeah, quite the difference. I definitely like this side better, but you can tell those taller grousers on the concrete floor were canted a little bit that way. But yeah, grouser height on those is like 95% yet. And leading up to this, a couple of people have said it would be nice to see like a side-by-side -side comparison between a chain that's at 100% stretch and one that's basically new. So the first thing we're gonna look at is how far out on the track frame this idler block is. We don't have very far to go and we'll be all the way out at the end. And looking at how much exposed adjuster thread we have right there, referencing the manual, it says at three, Limit of adjusting track. This measurement should not exceed three and one half inches. And right here, we are at three and three eighths. We're just about there. When you run the nut any further out than that, you don't have enough thread in the nut and then just the tension on it will damage the threads and then pretty soon you can't maintain proper adjustment. Referencing that to our newly reconditioned track chain that's had all of that slack bunched by doing the pin and bushing turn We're only at one and one quarter inches exposed adjuster thread We have moved this idler back in excess of two inches by performing that service also Notice how much track frame real estate there is out in front of this idler block Also when I put the front dirt guard back on look at how much overlap there's going to be front guard over rear guard two two and a half inches easy Compare that to our 100% worn side, we're just about opening up a gap. No overlap left there at all. Also on the worn side, look at how the track chain is running out of pitch with the sprocket. This bushing right here, instead of landing in the pocket, it's being picked up by the tip of the sprocket tooth. That just shows how much more distance there is between bushings than there is between sprocket teeth. This is also a direct correlation to the shiny wear that we noted when we had the chain off of the other side. Once again, with the reconditioned chain, you can see we are in perfect pitch with the sprocket. This bushing is going to land right down into the pocket. That's where we want it to be. We have the best surface area contact, the best load distribution, and we are not just solely relying on the leading edge tips of these teeth to do all of our work. So this side is wrapped up. Front dirt guard back in place. And I do enjoy looking at the cat logos on all of these bolts all the way down the line. So 
there is a certain method to the madness here. Having them all arranged just so facing the same direction lets you know at a glance if any of these have started to loosen up. If any of those logos are off kilter with the rest, you know you have a trackpad that needs attention. Plus, it leads to better and more restful sleep. And unfortunately, this is as far as we go with this episode. As some of you may have noticed, we have quite a few pieces missing on this side of the engine. So I'm not about to put all those wide track pads over here when I have a lot of work left to do. I haven't shared this on the public feed yet, but after that second really good break and run where we towed the RD6 around the field, I brought this back and I noticed there was uh, some drips starting on the floor. And long story short, I cleaned about two quarts of engine oil out of the belly pan. What I ended up finding was that oil manifold that I had done a solder repair job to back during the diesel engine rebuild series. It had developed a small leak behind this port and a large leak behind this one. And this really needs to be like silver soldered, something with better strength than the flux core solder that I put on here back at the time. My trouble is I can't silver solder to save my life. So it looks like I'm in for some definite practice. Um, we'll sweat all this back apart and try and redo it again and do it right this time. So just have to uh, keep attacking it until something finally works out. So as always, everyone, thank you for watching. And yeah, it would be nice to get this other track on. I kind of plan on getting this other 12 inch track off and then at least the, the new track put on with just the bare chain up and around that would still afford me more room than I have right now. We might still go that far. I don't know, but it's nice having another side done. It kind of motivates me to keep attacking this stubborn oil leak because um, this is the third time I've had that manifold off and I really don't want to have to do it again. So, all right, everybody, I'll let you all go. Like I said, thanks for watching and um, hope to see you all back again.